court and the teams are, have arrived and they're go, 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 go. And, uh, but just some of you uh, are on our, either on our Facebook prayer group, which, which if you're not, go to Gateway Foursquare Church on our Facebook page and you can find the prayer group. Uh, we send out email updates as people send them in. That's one of the ways we send them out as well as the email prayer team, uh, which you can send an email, info at gatewayfoursquare.ca and get on that list as well. But some of you would have got that this week, uh, and with the, a young man in the Dominican, Dominican named Junior, and he's the son of one of the staff members at Servant's Heart Ministry, uh, which is the ministry we've partnered with in the Dominican now for five or six years. And uh, he's been in the hospital and has been struggling with some issues that mean that he, they might have to like remove one of his legs, and he's been some other internal injuries that have gone on. And so we sent that out, uh, was that Wednesday or Thursday? What was that? Wednesday. So some of our prayer team people got it, and they prayed. And so the report back we got was that uh, Junior's mom had contacted Tanya and said, as we began to pray, he began to recover significantly. And so she's calling it a miracle because it's been that dramatic of a turnaround in the last couple of days. And so we'll fill you in a bit more, but I want to encourage you, God answers prayer. Come on. And so we're going we're gonna to give him the glory as he answers. And sometimes we don't get the exact timing of the way he does things and the manner that he does it. But I'm grateful that the, our God is a God that invites us to prayer with, pray with great faith and that he responds. And so anyways, praise the Lord uh, for Junior. And Lord, complete that work of healing in his body. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, we're going to continue this morning in a sermon series we began last week called Battle Ready. And uh, if you missed us last uh, Sunday, what we really came out of is I was watching the, the war movie Midway. And in the midst of that movie, somebody was escaping from a, like a downed airplane. And I was like, man, if I was in the military, I would want to be like working out so that if something like that happened, I would have the strength to get out of the scenario and in that moment, I was like, man, I'd want to be battle ready. And the Lord just dropped in my spirit in that moment. Man, in our spiritual lives, we also need to be battle ready. That we face spiritual battles in our lives. That we are called in scriptures. Last week, we looked at Ephesians 6, verse 10. Be strong in the Lord. I, I like to, can we interpret that and say, in other words, be battle ready. So that when the enemy comes against us, when, when battles, spiritual battles come against us, we have the strength to stand, to fight back, and to win. I, I love it. It's good. God wants us to win. Right? Okay, good. I wasn't sure if I was in the right church this morning, you know? <laughs> God wants us to win. We are more than overcomers in Christ. This is what the, the promise of the Scripture. And so today, I just want to take that another step forward, and I want to talk about faith for the battle. Faith for the battle. We're going to look out of uh, 2 Kings chapter 6 this morning. But as we get into that, uh, a number of years ago, I think it must have been when I was in my late teens or early 20s, uh, which for me is still is a significant season of my life as the Lord called me to ministry and was growing me in my faith and these cool, uh, these cool things. God is so gracious uh, in that. And I remember uh, the first time that I discovered the, uh, the message uh, paraphrase of the Bible. And some of you are familiar with the message paraphrase written by a guy named Eugene Peterson. He bring, often brings this just really fresh take on the word. I love it. It's a wonderful gift to the body. And I remember reading it and kind of being startled and confronted, as particularly in the Old Testament, when this phrase kept popping up in Scripture. He, right in the midst of a passage, it would be, the, and the God of angel armies. And I was like, my NIV doesn't say that. And, and I was a little startled because it seemed maybe too aggressive or something like that. God of angel armies. And so initially I was a bit skeptical. And so I was like, let's look into this. Why is he putting that in there? And I discovered that in most translations, the phrase that Eugene Peterson says, God of angel armies, is the, of a, maybe a more familiar description, the Lord of hosts. Which, when we say that, we feel, if you're a believer and you've been a believer for a while, sometimes we feel comfortable with that because we're used to it. But what does it mean, the Lord of hosts? What's a host? You know, some people, walk, as you walked in this morning, had a tag that said host. Is that what we're talking about? That God is the Lord of those people that graciously hand out the bulletin to you at church? <laughs> 
Well, he is there, Lord, but it's, it's more than that. A host is a large number of people, and in a maj- vast majority of the times, it's actually referring to an army. It's a military word. And, and so I love that sometimes, it, sometimes uh, because of translation, some things, some nuance can sometimes get lost. And so even saying God of angel armies, although it might make us a little uncomfortable initially, is quite accurate. But I want to just touch on that a little bit. Why, from some of us, does that become uncomfortable? Because for some of us, in our picture of God, we kind of can sometimes get out of balance. Here's the thing about the Lord. He is so multifaceted, you can't pick one description and then therefore understand Him all, right? Like, God is loving and patient and kind. Amen? But sometimes we ride really heavy on that, and we kind of get God, this picture in our mind that God's a big heavenly teddy bear and super nurturing. Is God nurturing? Yes. He describes himself even as like a mother hen and chicks. That's part of the nature of God. But that's not the totality of the nature of God. So even a description of God is the God of angel armies, which is like a hoorah moment, is also accurate. And we're going to see some places from Scripture. But before I read this, I just want to kind of talk about this because I know sometimes we can be uncomfortable, particularly in the Old Testament where there's a lot of fighting going on. How do we square a loving God with all of this bloodshed in the Old Testament? And the enemy will often try to use that against you to, to sow doubt into your heart. That maybe that's not the same God. Maybe the Old Testament isn't really God's word. Maybe they got it wrong. Well, here's the thing that we need to keep in mind. A, that God is fine being represented. I'm going to read some, some verses in this regard in a little bit. That, that, that God has a side of him that's justice and might and power. But also the context of the Old Testament helps us understand why is there so much fighting? This country versus that country and all these sorts of things. Well, because the context of the Old Testament, God chose out of all the peoples of the world one particular people for himself, the nation of Israel. And so some of the times in the Old Testament, God's not making like a forever command for all people that follow him forever. No, sometimes in the Old Testament, God is speaking to the nation of Israel on how they would deal with other nations around them, and it's very different. That, and it just makes sense. You know, God would tell them to go against their enemy, and what that meant for them was man the army and get into battle. Now, that doesn't mean God, when you have an enemy, God wants you to go get your sword and get stuff done. That's not the application, because you are not a country going against another country. You're not defending borders of your territory. And the church is not a church of that either. That's why Christians, whenever some extreme Christians kind of get this idea that like, let's go do the thing, they're wrong and the Lord deals with them. Our kingdom is not of this world. So we don't wage war against other kingdoms. So yeah, you, when we read in the Old Testament about somebody attacking Israel and them defending themselves, that doesn't mean we need to kind of go literally do that. But here's the thing we can learn from even those situations. And I think there's often a neat picture there for us about spiritual warfare and about the way those things work. And so I just want to throw that out there because it's often an area of, hmm, in our minds. How do we square it? We can square it. It's called context. Uh, And so I want to look at a passage of Scripture where an enemy comes against the nation of Israel, and I think we can learn something about the way spiritual battle works in your life out of this passage, because all Scripture is God-breathed, all Scripture is useful, beneficial, and so let's dig in this morning. Are you looking forward to it? Let's see what the Lord would have for us in 2 Kings chapter 6. It's a lengthy passage. We'll kind of break it down into a few big chunks and comment on our way Uh, through it. And so here we go. Once when the king of Syria was warring against Israel. So again, what's the context? The Syria, that's a country still there today, was coming against Israel. So it's not unreasonable to expect that they would defend themselves, is it? No. And again, I don't have time today to unpack how God uh, is still 
some of these scenarios are, ha- have happened in the last you know, number of decades and the way God has still worked with his people Israel. But that's a, I digress. Let's get back to the passage. Uh, so when the king of Syria was warring against Israel, he took counsel with his servants, saying, At such and such a place shall be my camp. But the man of God sent word to the king of Israel, the man of God being Elisha, not Elijah, Elisha, and said, Beware that you do not pass this place, for the Syrians are going down there. And the king of Syria sent, uh, excuse me, sent to the place about which the, uh, or sorry, the king of Israel sent to the place about which the man of God told him. Thus he used to warn him so that he saved himself more than once or twice. And so let's quickly pause here. Here we have this really interesting story. Syria's coming against Israel, and the king of Syria is like, all right, here's the battle plan. Let's set up camp here. Let's attack there. Let's make lines. Let's do this. All He's strategizing, but God messes up his plan. And I just what, what I see here in this passage is the role of the spiritual gifts in spiritual battle. How does God get this information to the king of Israel? Through the prophetic voice of the prophet. It's an interesting moment, isn't it? God's giving him insider information. He's giving him, giving Israel an unfair advantage over their enemies. And here's one thing I want to encourage us with when you consider the spiritual battles you're facing. Do you know what? God wants to give you an unfair advantage in your spiritual battle. He's a good father. Why would he not want to set you up to win? And so how does he do that? God still speaks to his people through the Spirit, through prophetic gifts, through words of knowledge, through these sorts of things. I want to encourage you that when you're facing a spiritual battle, don't only pray against the enemy, don't only pray to resist the devil, but also pray to say, God, would you give me spiritual insight, understanding, words of knowledge so that we can know how to fight the battle. God wants to give you an, un- an unfair advantage. And so I want to encourage you, when you pray in a battle, pray that God would, by His Spirit, give you the ability to understand things that you would not have otherwise understood. That you would know things that you would not have otherwise known. God still works that way. It's called the gifts of the Spirit. And I love just the little ways that this out, uh, works out in our lives. A few weeks ago, Deanna was telling me, uh, which I've, this is actually the, it's been a few times where we, when we come around to trying to sell a house or something like that, eventually Deanna gets like this sense to know something that she wouldn't have otherwise known. But a few weeks ago, some of you know that we were working on selling our house. And, um, and it, at that point, is about a month and a half, two months in, and and Deanna just had a sense. And so she told me earlier in the week, I think we're going to sell our house this weekend. Which in the natural might just seem like a hunch or an idea. But it was like more than that. That was my sense, right? Babe? Like it was like the Lord was prompting that. Now that wasn't kind of like a big spooky like, thus saith the Lord, you shall sell your house. This, no, no, it was just a little thing on the inside. And when that in on the inside, we then approached an open house and some things with a sense of expectation. Thank you, Lord, that we're going to sell our house. And guess what happened that weekend? We sold our house. Now, don't worry. We bought another house in Campbell River. It's all good. We're moving March 21st if you want to come help load and unload. <laughs> you can tell us. But anyways, I'll feed you pizza. Um, that was shameless, but I don't feel bad about it at all. Anyways... <laughs> But the thing was, it's just a little example, not of some big epic spiritual battle that we had insight, but it's just a a picture of what it might look like or feel like. God sometimes speaks to us in ways that are actually quite subtle, where we just, it's hard to explain, but when it happens, you just know it. You just know that you know. Have you heard that phrase before? Don't be surprised. And actually, ask the Lord for those things because He loves you and wants to speak to you by His Spirit. What if you're facing a battle 
and you're not sure what the next step for you to do, rather than just focusing on the enemy and like, you know, all this sort of stuff, just pause and say, thank you, Lord. Give me the insight that I need. And then keep your ears open. Don't be surprised when he answers. It's what he did for Israel. And uh, we believe God's the, still the same yesterday, today, and forever. He wants to give you an unfair advantage. And it's really not unfair. It's called you're his kids. He's a loving heavenly father. And no wonder he wants to allow you to walk in victory. And one of the ways he does that, he gives you things in advance so that you can operate in faith and step into them. Okay, let's keep going. So again, more than once, more than once or twice, this is how Israel was rescued from the Syrians. God kept messing up the plans of the enemy through prophetic word. Verse 11, and the mind of the king of Syria was greatly troubled because of this thing. And he called his servants and said to them, will you not show me who of us is for the king of Israel? What's he saying? There's a spy. We've got a mole. Someone's feeding him this information because he can't figure it out. How are they always in the right spot? It goes on. One of his servants said, none, my lord, O king. They knew there was, they, no one was loose lips. But Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. Man, that's a hard enemy to fight against when they know things they shouldn't know. And he said, go and, see, um, go and see where he is, that I may send and seize him. It was told him, because he is in Dothan, so he sent the, their horses and chariots and a great army, and they came by night, and he surrounded the city. Does that sound like a frustrated king, if you ever heard of one? He is annoyed. He's, like, he's frustrated. Uh, he's troubled, because it just... I think he had an inkling God was on their side. And so what does he do? He goes in with full manpower. We don't know how many people, but it says a great army, and that's pretty big. And also not just a bunch of soldiers, but it makes it clear, horses and chariots, which in, in Bible times, that meant strong and rich, powerful. That were, those were the signs that your military was like grade A. Just like the Americans today have like the most aircraft carriers out of any nation in the world, like that's the status symbol that says don't mess with us. Horses and chariots were a way as a king, you would pad your army to tell everyone else around you, don't mess with us, we're the real deal. And so he goes in with, with his army to go after one guy, Right? Like, we gotta, we got to set the scene, because if we don't set the scene, we may miss what's happening here. I wonder if you've ever felt like you're in a spiritual battle where it's you against the hordes of the enemy. Let's, let's put ourselves, let's, let's imagine a little bit with our holy imagination what this might have been like. I think it makes the story come to life so that we can learn from it and apply it far more clearly. And so here we go. They surround the city. They came by night. And surrounded the city. Verse 15. When the servant of the man of God rose early in the morning and went out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. So again, pause for a second. You're hanging out with your buddy Elisha. You guys are serving God together. How awesome is this? And, you know, you wake up in the morning, head out of your tent or your house, whatever it was, you know, maybe he's just doing his morning routine, about to brew his cup of coffee, and he pops out, and what does he see? The city unexpectedly surrounded by an army, chariots, and horses. How would you feel? Modernize it a second. Well, although it's still scary enough if you had a bunch of chariots and horses surrounding your area, but what if it was tanks and people with big, like, uh, like machine guns and all these sorts of things. It's going to create some feelings inside of you. Shake it in your boots. And what is it? It goes on here. The servant said, alas, my master, what shall we do? I think we need to read some enthusiasm into that moment because it, this guy's terrified. 
So Elisha the prophet responds like this. He said, do not be afraid. Why did he say that? Because he was afraid. Which is, in the natural, a very reasonable response. If, if all things equal, you would be too. But God. So Elisha begins to respond in a very different way. Think about this. The same circumstances that produce fear in the servant don't rattle Elisha. And I just wonder if there's something here in this story for us that would indicate that we have an opportunity that when the same spiritual battle comes against you that terrifies somebody else, you can have a different response. You don't need to be shaken in your boots. What am I going to do? We don't see Elisha have that moment. It actually seems like he's super cool and calm and collected in this moment. And I, I think believers today, church, when we face a spiritual battle, we can be the cool, calm, and collected ones. I remember reading a story in the biography of a gentleman named Smith Wigglesworth. Some of you might have heard his name before. If you haven't, go read some of his crazy stories. God used him in evangelism, healing ministry, all these sorts of things. And there's an account one time where uh, he wakes up in the middle of the night and like a demon is like shaking his bed or something like that. Again, we're going to get to the reality of angels and demons in a couple of weeks. But needless to say, the Bible's full of these stories and so we wouldn't be surprised. This guy that's having an impact against the kingdom of darkness, no wonder the enemy wants to terrify him. So th- this, his bed or whatever is, is shaking, and, and Smith Wigglesworth w- wakes up and just looks at this demon and says, oh, it's just you, and falls back asleep. <laughs> I want to be in a place, right, where the, the, the enemy could come against, but if we know our authority, cool, calm, and collected like Elisha. Man, how cool would that be? You recognize demonic forces and you're like, oh, it's just you. No big deal. I'm going to go back to sleep. Where most of us would be like, even if you saw an angel, we'll need the Lord to come and say, fear not. <laughs> right, let's go a little bit further here. It says, that, do not be afraid. Why? How can he be so cool, calm, and collected? For those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Elisha knows something the servant doesn't know. Elisha sees something the the servant doesn't see. He knows that there is a spiritual battle taking place. And, And so what does he do? He graciously prays. And again, can we just validate that, yes, this story in the natural, if you're thinking like just in a like normal Canadian mode, this is a weird story. But the Bible recognizes the reality that there is a spiritual unseen world that is real. You don't see God in the flesh, and He's real, amen? More real than anything else. And again, church, we got to make sure that our Western sensibilities don't creep into our Christian worldview, a, a Western model that's kind of eliminated anything spiritual. That's just for those like, you know, new age hippies. That's, not, that's nothing real. It's just all made up. No, no, no. There are spiritual realities. And this is what we're encountering here in this story. And so what does it go on? It goes on to say, uh, he knows that he's got his back covered. There are people on Elisha's side. Then Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elijah. I kind of like it. God one-ups the king of Syria. I've got an army. I've got chariots. I've got... uh, I've got horses, and these ones are on fire. Like, how much cooler is that than real horses and chariots? Flaming horses and chariots. It's good for us to ask the question, what what are those? What's going on? I think they're angels. But do you see how that's very different than our, our cutesy little angels that we think of? Like a little chubby cherub with like a bow and arrow, like ding, like... Valentine's Day, we're like, oh, look at the angels. No, 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 no. The angels are better. 
in Scripture, when angels show up, people freak out. We underestimate, because of our cute little picture of angels, the power of the spiritual forces of the kingdom of God. These are chariots and horses and on fire. We see that's the way Elijah, the, his, the, the, the prophet before Elisha, I know, wonderfully confusing, but that's how he got to heaven in a chariot of fire. Th- these are entities, these are beings that are being sent by God, and that's the definition of an angel. An angel is a sent one. And so here we have, and we see other places in Scripture, this description says in Psalm 34, 7, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear God. There's a great verse for you. The angel of the Lord, if you're somebody that fears God, what does that mean? That you reverence and awe God, that you, that you respect and obey Him, that the angel of the Lord encamps around you. Do you know you can, t- that's one way you fight a spiritual battle. I wasn't planning on preaching that first, but I'm going to preach it for a second. When you sense that you are in a spiritual battle, and that can look like a lot of things. A spiritual battle might be a financial crisis. A spiritual battle might be a relationship that's for some reason gone haywire. A spiritual battle might be an addiction. A spiritual battle uh, might be any number of things. But guess what? When you feel the enemy coming back against you, you can be cool, calm, and collected. And say, thank you, Lord, that the angel of the Lord is encamping around me. Because, God, I fear you. I trust you, Lord. You are my God, and I will serve you. And so I thank you today, Lord, that your angel, your angels are surrounding me. That's spiritual warfare. Something going on in your heart recognizing the truth of God's word. God gives your, his word gives you the promises you need to hear. What an incredible moment. And it's not inappropriate that God would have an army. Because again, so often we, we so over soften God's image, we forget about his God as a warrior character. It's not, and again, God's beyond us, so it's not, con- although it seems contradictory, it's the greatness of God. You can't put him all in one little neat box. He defies the categories. So it's not inappropriate for us to consider our God as a warrior God. You know, there's a few places in Scripture that this is is really clear. Exodus 15 is a great moment. The nation of Israel has fought a spiritual battle. They were in slavery. And there's no way on their own they could get out. So God intervenes. God rescues them. He delivers them. God wants to rescue you from bondage. And he wants to win a spiritual battle for you. Let's look. Exodus chapter 15, verse 1. Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, which is awesome. God sets them free. And what do they do? They sing. That's one of the reasons we sing as we gather. Sometimes just words don't do enough. We've got to turn it into a song. And they sing, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. God beat the the army of Egypt. At that time, probably the strongest army on the face of the planet. And they're celebrating because God defeated them. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. Listen to this verse 3. The Lord is a man of war. And the Lord is his name. Does that mess up your picture of God a little bit? Some of us are like, ooh, uh, this seems so aggressive. The Bible said it. God, the Lord, is a man of war. That doesn't mean he's actually, like, physically a man. Well, other than when he was incarnated in Jesus, obviously. But it's using earthly words to describe a God that like, they're having a hard time figuring out who this guy is. But he's just delivered them. The Lord, he, God's not afraid to be called that. God doesn't step in and say, hey, stop singing that song. I'm only meek and mild. Like, you know, kumbaya, let's, let's sing a song together. No. Now, is God gracious and loving and patient and kind? Yes. But he's, we got to round out the picture accurately. Which it's good to know when you're fighting a battle that the Lord is a man of war. 
it's all right to be a bit aggressive when you're in a battle. I, I, was, I was meeting with some people this week, and uh, they've got some adult kids and grandkids and some really gong show stuff going on. And I was so pleased because they recognized this is a battle and we need to fight. And that doesn't mean they're going to go punch anyone in the neck. It means they're going to pray. It means they're going to love. It means that they're going to claim the promises of God. That the fruit of our womb is blessed. And they're going to pray. And they're going to not just sit back and be like, that's a terrible situation. Like, pass the popcorn. Like, no, no. They're going to dig in. Fight. And how is, do we know it's okay to fight? Well, my God is a God of war. He's a man of war. What am I encouraging you? In the spiritual battle, you need to, you, we need to get a bit more aggressive. We're so Canadian sometimes. That's one of the reasons we don't like hearing the Lord is a man of war. It's because you're Canadian. You would go to other countries or other times of world history, and when you would say the Lord is a man of war, people would be like, that's right, my God's a man of war. But in our culture, because we're so Canadian, so proper, we're like, ooh, that might be offensive to some people. Right? But we need to think about the Lord the way the Bible talks about the Lord. Here's another example. When, when King David goes against the giant, what's his name? David and Goliath. He goes against, that's a battle. There's a spiritual picture in there for us too. Listen to this. David interacting with the giant. Little David, big giant. You come to me with a sword and with a spear and a javelin, which again, a big giant guy taller than anyone you've ever seen carrying real weapons coming against you in the natural, you should be terrified. But what do Elisha and David have in common? It's this ingredient called faith. So how does David respond? He says, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. There it is, God of angel armies. The God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. Definitely not politically correct. And I will give the dead, bo the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Man, there's a little bit of a roar moment in that battle. How does he? Because David had faith in the God of the universe. He had faith in the Lord that he was powerful enough to bring him victory. And this is the same, the same faith that Elisha has as we're reading in 2 Kings chapter 6. Let's go back and round out the rest of the story. And so uh, God opens the servant's eyes. He sees this, these chariots and horses and all these sorts of things. And then let's see what happens here in verse 18. And when the Syrians came down against him, so here they're coming, all of them coming for one guy, Elisha. Uh, what happens? Uh, Elisha prayed to the Lord. So how is he battling? Elisha didn't whip out his sword. He didn't pull out a slingshot. He prayed. He prayed to the Lord and said, please strike this people with blindness. It's interesting, he just prayed that the servant's eyes would be open, and now he's praying that these guys would be made closed. So he struck them, the Lord struck them with blindness in, according to the, with, in accordance with the prayer of Elisha. Do you know God, uh, God answers prayer? And in a spiritual battle, you need to open your mouth and pray, and the Lord answers. That's one of the keys we're going to talk more about prayer next week as a tool in our battle, of, in the spiritual battles we face. But here we again, we see this connection to prayer. And what happens? The Lord does it in accordance with his, uh, the prayer of Elisha. And Elisha said to them, and this is funny. I think this is meant to be a bit comical. It's hilarious. And Elisha says to them, who the army of, the, of Syria, who's now all blind. Imagine that. This great army is now all feeling their self. C can you see? I can't see either. What's going on here? And Elisha steps in and says, this is not the way, and this is not the city. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. Who's the man they're seeking? Elisha. 
And he's the one saying, you're not looking for me. You're in the wrong place. Come this way. This is meant to be funny. And he led them to Samaria. And now listen to this. It gets like, and as, uh, as soon as they entered Samaria, uh, Elisha said, Oh, Lord, open the eyes of these men. This blindness was temporary, that they may see. So the Lord opened their eyes, and they saw. And behold, they were in the midst of, the, they were in the midst of Samaria. And as soon as the king of Israel saw them, he said to Elisha, My father, shall I strike them down? Shall I strike them down? So, like, the king is like, man, you brought them all here into our city. Like, do I do the thing now where our country goes against their country? Listen to what happens. Um, And he answered, you shall not strike them down. Would you strike those whom you have taken captive with a sword and with your bow? He's like, that's not right. These are all, like, prisoners of war. That would just not be okay for us to kill them. So what? So set bread and water before them. Feed them that they may eat and drink and go to their master. So he prepared for them a great feast. Takes it another notch, not just bread and water. He gives them a feast. And when they'd eaten and drunk, he sent them away, and they went to their master, the king of Syria. And the Syrians did not come again on raids into the land of Israel. Any wonder why? They're not messing with that country because they have a God that fights for them. We could go to any number of places in the Bible where God fights battles on behalf of his people. Where sometimes even in the night, the enemies are defeated. They're sleeping and God takes care of it. Why share these stories? Why look at these pictures today? Because I think that we also can be like Elisha. And God wants to stir faith in our hearts so that when we face a battle, we recognize it doesn't matter if it seems impossible in the natural. Your debt load might seem so impossible that you may never overcome it. Your sickness might seem so impenetrable that it's never going to change. The circumstance that you're facing, the natural may look impossible, but what God is saying, He's inviting you to believe Him. That God fights for His people. There's some great promises in the Scriptures. It says, Zechariah chapter 4 and verse 6, it says this, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. God's not looking for you and your own strength to fight the battle. But so often we spend time fighting our own battles and our own strength and then wonder why it flops. God's saying, let me fight. There's more on your side than their side. Not by might. For some of us today, we need to not put faith in our own strength anymore. We need to call an end to it and say, it wasn't working anyways. So God, I'm going to rely on your strength. And guess what, Lord? You are more than able. You have all power. You are immortal. You are the invisible God. You see now how you begin to pray with the word of God. God, I can't. Do you know when, when we pray and come to, the God, come to God and say, I can't do this, God's like, I already knew that. I'm happy you got the memo. Now I can work. Not by your might, not by power, not because you have horses and chariots and you can battle and all these things, but by the Spirit of God we find victory. What battle are you fighting, trying to fight in your own strength? Maybe today is the day you'll let that faith rise up in your heart and you'll say, God, I'm going to totally distrust you in this. It's a big step. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16, we, that was our, our, our text last week in Ephesians 6. We talked about the armor of God. We'll come back to that more as well. But it says in Ephesians 6, 16, that in all circumstances, whatever battle you're facing, take up the shield of faith, which, with, with which you can extinguish all. Everyone say all. All means all. It doesn't mean some. All the flaming darts of the evil one. The enemy's coming after you, and he's lobbing these darts Flaming darts to take you down, to destroy you and lead to death. But the Bible says that if we take up that shield of faith, that we can extinguish all of those, all of those darts. What's the required element? Faith. I was doing some reading this week about what kind of shield, because that's kind of cool, military equipment. It's this Roman shield specifically that they're talking, Paul's talking about there. He might have seen one probably earlier in the day with a Roman soldier walking by. 
kind of this rectangular, fairly large shield with a bit of a curve in the thing so that, like, they would basically be quite well protected behind it. And if you got a bunch of shoulder, soldiers side by side and in row upon row, they would make this kind of shield protection. And it was covered over wood, covered over with leather that often if the ba- they knew the enemy had fl- flaming darts, common strategy, you know, not just in Robin Hood, people actually did that. And they would, soak the, they would soak the shield in water. The leather on the outside would absorb the water so that when the fiery dart hit it, it would go out. So there's stories of people fighting, and they've got like hundreds of arrows in their shield, and they're still fighting because it hadn't got to them. This is the picture of a believer against the, the work of the enemy. And it's faith, that's the, uh, faith is the shield. My God's fighting for me kind of faith. Nothing is impossible for those that believe kind of faith. That's how we throw up the shield. And the enemy's work against us is stopped and silenced in the name of Jesus. Man, we could go on and on and on. It wouldn't be inappropriate. A couple more verses, though. 1 Samuel 17, 47. Again, back to uh, little David and big Goliath. Right before he goes into battle, he declares, the battle belongs to the Lord. Would you let the Lord fight your battle? That's hard, though. And that also doesn't mean we just sit back and say, God, you're fighting the battle, unless the Lord told you just to sit. Often it requires us responding, but we respond from a place of victory and a place of faith. You know, again, the Bible did encourage us, be strong in the Lord, this is, but in His strength, remember? It's trying to find this balance of, Lord, I want to respond in faith, but I need to do it in Your strength and in Your timing and listening to the voice of Your Spirit. God wants to lead us to victory. There's one last picture I want to share with us, or point from, uh, by picture I mean a story from the Bible that I think is relevant in this spiritual battle thing. Again, calling us to put our faith in the Lord alone. It's from Acts chapter 19. It's this interesting little story, uh, kind of another funny story in the Bible. Like it's okay to recognize that sometimes these stories are funny, and often I think God means it that way. But here in this story, there's this group of uh, seven sons, and their title, their job description is that they are exorcists. That's their trade. They're itinerant exorcists. They were tra- they're, these guys are Jewish. They're traveling around Israel, and if they would find someone possessed by a demon, they'd try to cast the demon out. We don't know. I would imagine that if they were being able to make a career out of this thing, that at least some of the time they were effective. I, you know, you'd think. I don't know for sure, but I'm assuming. But listen to this story that happens, Acts 19, 13. And again, if you're like, you might be like, oh, he's talking about demons and exorcisms and stuff like that. Yes, we believe in those things that they're real. Why? Jesus cast out demons. And actually in Mark chapter 16 in the Great Commission, it says that these signs will accompany those that believe that they will cast out demons. Believer, you have the, you have the ability to do this. But you have to do it right. So let's see how these guys did it wrong and then learn something. And so it says here, some of these, the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits. They saw Christians doing this, and it was working. And so they're like, man, if we just kind of throw Jesus' name into our spell, it'll work. So they try that, and they say, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Is it just a magic formula, the name of Jesus? Listen to what happens. Seven sons of the Jewish high priest. These guys aren't like unknown guys. Like their dad's the high priest. They're kind of big deal. They're these exorcists. The high priest named uh, Sceva were doing this. But listen, verse 15, the evil spirit answered them. The demon talks back. And says, Jesus I know, Paul I recognize, but who are you? What the demon understands something about authority. The demon knows that you just can't say Jesus' name like it's a magic formula. There was something missing. These guys didn't have personal faith in Jesus. They were just trying to use the name Jesus. And there's a difference. Coming to the Lord isn't just kind of like, you know, say the right words in the right order and that. No, no, no. It's personal faith. 
in what Jesus is able to do. And that's why when we pray in Jesus' name, we're saying, God, I recognize that you have given me rightful authority and the power to do this, not because it's my own strength, but because it's your strength in me. And then it really works. But in this case, what happens? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them. He mastered all of them, which again, imagine, seven guys beat by one guy. And he overpowers them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. They lost, and they lost bad. God doesn't want you to lose. He doesn't want you to lose bad. In fact, he says that in, in him, God, in, Jesus is an overcomer, in him we are also overcomers. We are victorious in Christ Jesus. And what's the ingredient? Personal faith in him. Knowing that he's more than able. He has all power. He is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. So I want to encourage us today as we're talking about spiritual battles, that we would have our faith to fight. But we've got to make sure our faith is in the right spot. And more, more particularly in the right person. In Jesus. I want to encourage you that God makes incredible promises. Why? So that as we hear them, faith would rise in our heart and we could win. That we can fight the good fight of faith. We've got what we need. Jesus has done the work. He died on the cross already. And so when you face a battle, don't just sit back and be like, well, eventually I'll get to heaven. No, 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 no. Get up, be strong, and fight with faith. Not faith in your faith. Sometimes we do that, man, I'm just so good at believing we can take confidence in our own faith. Sometimes we take, put confidence in our own, or faith in our own good, effort, good work. Maybe you've, you've had seasons in your life where you're like, man, I'm such a great Christian. Like I'm reading my Bible every, and sometimes we don't consciously think this, but this is the way we think. You know, I, like I read my Bible every day this week, and I like didn't, I wasn't mean to anybody, and, and I went to church, and I'm doing all the right things, and we begin to be confident in ourselves. Faith in that also is not faith that leads to victory. We need to continue to put our faith in Him alone. He's done all the work. And again, that doesn't mean we don't respond to His love towards us by following Him and obeying His commands. We yes, 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 but we don't put confidence in that. The Apostle Paul said it like this, Our righteousness is like filthy rags, even on your best day. It doesn't make you any more right with God. What makes you right with God is that you have faith in the Lord. And the Lord is saying, believe in me because I have all power. And I want to fight your battles. And I want to lead you to victory. Trust him. Trust me. That's what the Lord is saying. Don't trust me either. Faith in your pastor is also not the key to success. It's in the Lord. It's a good job of any pastor. Is don't look at me. Look to the Lord. We're all looking that way. Let's do this together. Can we stand together this morning? Dee, if you could come, that'd be awesome. I want to encourage us today to have faith for the battle. The battle belongs to the Lord. God wants to give you an unfair advantage to fight the battle you're facing. I wonder if there's some people here today Again, I'm not going to pass the mic around, and I'm not asking even for hands, but I'm just assuming that there's some people here today that are fighting battles that you've not been able to overcome. The Lord wants to fight the battle for you. Would you trust Him with it? Would you surrender to Him and say, God, you're, you've got this thing. I can't, I'm exhausted trying in my own strength. Lord, would you fight this one for me? I want to give us an opportunity right now to do that, to respond to the Lord in faith. And so can we just bow our heads before the Lord, and I want to pray for us. Lord, I just thank you for your word today, and I pray that it would have all the effect that you desire it to have today. I thank you, Lord, your word does not return void. But Lord, as we've now thought and drawn our attention to various examples, then there are many more in Scripture where you sap supernaturally fight battles on behalf of your people, where you reveal yourself, Lord, as the man of war. Lord, that we, I pray, God, that our hearts and our minds our faith, Lord, would be lined up with the reality of your word. Would you renew our thinking? And Lord, I pray that, Lord, per perhaps we've been facing battles, but we kind of forgot you want to fight the thing, and we've been trying on our own. Lord, today we just confess that for what it is. It's foolhardy. 
it's not going to lead to victory, but we thank you that when we put faith in you, it's that shield that can extinguish every fiery dart of the enemy. So, Lord, I pray today that if we're here, if we're one of those that are trying in our own strength, Lord, that you would give us faith to believe that you're as good as you say you are and that you are as powerful as your word reveals. Would you do that work? Which just, again, this is not about anyone else seeing it. My eyes are closed too. But if, if you're here today and, and with our eyes closed and our heads bowed, if you're here today and you have and you know in your heart that you've been relying in your own strength, would you just make a pr- turn a prayer in your own heart, even out of your own mouth, uh, before the Lord and say, Lord, forgive me for relying on my own power, on my own strength, and then put your faith and trust in the Lord? You can only do that for yourself. So, Lord, we just pray, God, that you would enable us more than ever before to believe, to believe in you. I thank you that faith comes by hearing, God. Would you help open my ears to hear the reality of who you are? And, Lord, that, that would cause faith to rise in my heart to believe, and then to have victory through faith. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that everyone who's been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Our faith in you, not ourselves, not our strength, not our righteousness, but in you and you alone. Lord, we place our faith fresh in just you alone today. You are the only one that can save. You're the only one that can deliver. You're the only power that will lead us to victory. Thank you, Lord. And then, church, in this moment, this atmosphere, as we've declared God's truth, if you've got a battle you're facing and maybe you've not brought it to the Lord, can you just begin to pray right now for it in faith? Let's do some warfare together. I've declared some promises. Maybe you know some other scriptures that you just want to pray over your circumstance. Let's do that right now. And there's something about even letting it out of our mouths. You don't need to shout about it. You could. You don't need to. But let's, let's open our mouths before the, in, in faith today. Lord, I thank you. You are fighting my battle. Lord, I bring my circumstance to you today. I bring my addiction. I bring my debt. I bring my relational crisis. Lord, I bring my job scenario. Lord, I bring it to you in faith. And I thank you, Lord, that as I trust in you, you will fight my battle. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus over your people today. God, would you blind and silence the enemy enemies that are coming against us. Lord, would you confuse the work of the enemy over your people right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, I thank you that you are, you are powerful. You are mighty to save. You are our deliverer. And so, God, we come before you this morning and we rejoice and know that you are fighting on our behalf. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that nothing is impossible when we believe. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Give us victory. Lord, give us the the determination, the stamina to see it through to victory. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Can we do one last thing? And again, with everyone's heads bowed and our eyes closed, I just want to ask a question. It's appropriate. It's always a good question. But in order to come in, to this place of victory, we've got to come into a relationship with Jesus. And I just wonder if there's any here today that have not ever made your own personal decision to follow Jesus and to put your faith in Him. I want to give you an opportunity right now in this moment. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 10 that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, if we make Jesus the leader of our life, our boss, so to speak, and that if we believe in our hearts that God raised Him from the dead, we will be saved. It's just a prayer away to come into a relationship with God where we too can know Him as our Heavenly Father and have eternal life with Him and know the, begin to know the victories He wants to fight on our behalf. I wonder if there's anyone here today that would pray a prayer with me to put your own faith and trust in the Lord. So what I want to do is, if you're here today and you've never made a personal decision with, to, to follow Jesus and would like to, I, I, would you pray a prayer with me now? I'll pray a part and you can repeat. It's not about the magic words in the prayer. It's about our hearts of faith. also want to encourage you, maybe you're here and a long time ago you came into that relationship with the Lord, but you've strayed and are not walking with Him and would like to rededicate yourself. Would you also pray this prayer with me in faith today? And actually I just want to encourage everyone, believers, everybody in the room, let's pray this out loud together. 
uh, as a response today as we thank the Lord for his invitation to come into relationship with him. So would you pray and repeat this after me? Heavenly Father, I thank you that you love me, that you created me and have good plans for me. But I recognize that my sin, that my rebellion has separated me from you. Lord, I, I know that I'm dead in my sin. But today, I put my faith in Jesus. I believe that he died for my sin and has risen again. Lord, I ask you would for, that you'd forgive me of my sin. I'm sorry I've offended you. And I thank you that the blood of Jesus pays the price for my sin. Today, Jesus, I make you Lord, leader of my life. And I thank you that my life is now eternal and abundant in you. I call myself a Christian. I will no longer be the same. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said, amen. Doesn't it feel good even to declare a prayer like that? Praise the Lord. But here's the thing, if you're here today and that was the first time you prayed that prayer, as I, just after I say amen, I want you to come up and tell me. There's some free resources we want to give you today, a Bible, some resources on how you can grow in a walk with the Lord. Also, maybe you've walked from the Lord and today was a day where you prayed that to rededicate yourself. Come quickly. I want to chat with you after the service. It's the best decision you can make and we'd love to celebrate with you. Amen? So church, we are overcomers in Christ, not in ourselves, but in Him. Let's fight with faith. Let's believe for victory in the battles that we're facing. Amen? We love you. We're so glad that you came to church today. Have an awesome week. We'd love to see you tonight at prayer, 6 o'clock. Uh, OSL, 3 o'clock. It's coming. It's going to be good. Bless you. Have an awesome week. And we'll see you soon. Amen. Thank you, Lord.